Hello, hello. My name is Allie Weller, and I'm a greenhouse gas emissions specialist with training from the Greenhouse Gas Institute and the World Bank Group. And I am also a person who spent time living in the Arctic Circle. And so I would like everybody to briefly take themselves off mute and just let me know that you can see my photo and that you can hear my voice and then put yourself back on mute again, please. Yep. Yes. Yay, good. I'm very happy to hear that. Okay. And yes. Then <laughs> Wonderful. And then just mute yourself again so that you can enjoy your lunch or breakfast or afternoon snack, whichever part of the world that you're in while we have this talk. So I mentioned that I lived in the Arctic Circle. I actually lived in the Canadian High Arctic Circle where I saw Arctic ice melt and animal migration changes due to human caused climate change. And now I live on a farm in a part of the world where we risk seeing millions of climate refugees in my lifetime, that's California. Nevertheless, I have hope because there's a sea change of solutions rapidly building momentum globally, even in the United States. Hope has a caveat though, we must act. Millions of people already are mobilizing. How can you get involved? I'll cover some of the best known solutions as well as who's already taking action and where we could use your help. Whether you're a beginner or an expert in climate change, I hope you'll leave inspired, hopeful, impassioned, and ready to take action that makes sense for you. My talk today is part of a series of talks that are being given by thousands of climate leaders like me all over the world as part of a larger event called 24 Hours of Reality, Countdown to the Future. Just full disclosure, the 24 hours actually started on last weekend and it's been extended through the week because we have 3,000 people who are delivering these talks over this period of time. They wanted to be included in the 24 hours of reality. When we kicked off Countdown to the Future this year, we knew that this moment in the United States was going to be a critical time for action. As the world faces the intersectional injustices of the COVID-19 pandemic, and structural and institutional racism, and the climate crisis, we know you're feeling the weight of this moment, and we are too. So this July, I was part of 500 mentors from all over the world who trained almost 10,000 new climate leaders in our first ever global training event, all virtually led online. I myself was trained by Al Gore in Mexico City in 2018. And if you're interested in becoming a climate leader, let me know at the end of this talk. In August, we wrapped up the second global training and we are thrilled to welcome so many new climate reality leaders to the leadership core of now over 31,000 trained activists spanning over 170 countries worldwide. And since my journey with climate reality started with Al Gore, I'll let him introduce me. Hello everyone, I'm Al Gore and I want to thank you for joining us today for 24 hours of reality countdown to the future. As all of you know, we're living through truly extraordinary times. And if you're like most people, you look at these challenges that we're facing now, the climate crisis getting worse, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, structural and institutional racism, the challenges to the operations of democracy, and you ask yourself, what can we do? How do we overcome these truly existential threats that are connected and how do we build together the sustainable future and the just and fair future that we want and deserve? Well, the presentation you're about to hear and the discussion you're about to join is about these questions. Your host is an incredible climate reality leader that I personally have worked with and through their presentation, you'll learn the science behind the climate crisis and why it is having such a devastating impact on the ecological balance of our planet. You'll also learn how the climate crisis is connected to the COVID-19 pandemic and is connected to the broader injustices and inequities, not only in the U.S. where I'm located, but in places all around the planet. 
Just as important, you'll learn that we have the solutions and you'll learn how we can work together to solve these crises, starting with a green recovery and with a just transition to clean energy and the, the technologies that can make our world better in every way. You'll learn what you personally can do to make a difference and to help us create the future that we want and that humanity deserves. So before I hand you back to your host, I wanna say one other thing. Thank you for being a part of this global conversation. The truth of our circumstances is very clear. We have to solve the climate crisis and we have the solutions we need today. I know that we can solve the climate crisis. We have the political will. You know it's a renewable resource, but it's really because of people like you who are ready to commit the time and energy and attention and stand up and fight for a better world. Because of you, I know that we will succeed. Thank you. So let's start with a little perspective. This is the famous blue marble image that shows our Earth from space and reminds us that we all share the same home. This photo was taken during the last Apollo mission. What makes the photograph so unique and powerful is that it captures the complete circle of the Earth, helping us see the big picture of our planet and our lives on it. It was the first time the Apollo mission made it possible to capture almost the entire southern polar ice cap. And here is the first of those links that I'm providing you. This is a fun one. If you'd like to hear firsthand what it's like to gaze upon this one precious planet from space from an astronaut who just returned from space last April, NASA's Jessica Mayer returned from the first women-only mission on the International Space Station, which was a seven-month mission that began before the pandemic and returned mid-pandemic to a very changed world. And when she returned, my friend Jenna Matecki, who is in the Netherlands, and who also is a climate leader who was trained during the global event that I mentored, uh, my friend Jenna interviewed Jessica Mayer. And in the interview, Jessica does actually refer to some of the photos that former astronauts have taken of the planet. So, Jessica Mayer commented that she had seen photos before, but when she was actually in space, seeing the Earth from space in person, what really struck her was how thin and tenuous the band of the atmosphere is, how thin and fragile that blue band appears. In today's talk, I'm going to ask three questions. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? Must we change? Yes, we must change because we're using this thin shell of the atmosphere surrounding our planet as an open sewer, and we're spewing all the human-made global warming pollution into it. The natural greenhouse gas layer is good for us. It acts like a blanket that keeps us warm. When carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 280 parts per million, the Earth is at an ideal temperature but our atmospheric carbon dioxide hasn't been at 280 parts per million since prior to the Industrial Revolution. It's been rising steadily since we started burning fossil fuels and changing our land use. Nearly half of the solar energy that reaches the top of the Earth's atmosphere is absorbed by the planet's surface. The average solar radiation striking the top of the atmosphere is 340 watts per square meter and about 29% of that is reflected back into space. About 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere and about 48% is absorbed by the Earth's surface. The Earth's surface releases more heat than it receives from the sun. The planet's surface releases heat equivalent to 117% of the incoming solar radiation, which is about 398 watts per square meter. Greenhouse gases play an instrumental role in amplifying solar energy and retaining heat. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor are opaque to many wavelengths of outgoing thermal infrared energy. Uh, 
So each blocks a particular wavelength of energy and absorbs it or radiates it. Half of that gets radiated back to Earth and the other half towards space. Some of the heat radiated downwards is absorbed again by the Earth and ultimately radiated back into the atmosphere. This is how the Earth radiates more energy as heat than it receives as solar radiation. Burning fossil fuels means greater concentrations of greenhouse gases have disrupted this process and put the Earth's energy equilibrium out of balance. Today, less average energy leaves the atmosphere and comes in. Today, higher concentrations of greenhouse gases trap about extra three watts of incoming solar energy per square meter of the Earth's surface. While the amount of extra heat energy seems small on paper, it has a large effect on the entire planet. The result is global warming. By the end of 2018, the warming influence of greenhouse gases had risen 43% above 1990 levels. And this is because the atmosphere is getting thicker because we're spewing 152 million tons of human-made global warming pollution into it every day, treating it like an open sewer. It comes from lots of different sources. It comes from landfills, from transportation, burning forest and cropland, animal agriculture. The permafrost is thawing and that's playing a role too. As greenhouse gas emissions specialist trained with the GHG Institute, I'm primarily concerned with six greenhouse gas categories in particular. These are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those. To start with carbon dioxide, 75% of our human-made carbon dioxide emissions are from the burning of fossil fuels. For example, the generation of electricity. For transportation would be another example. The other 25% are largely from land use, like deforestation and industrial agriculture, including from burning forest and cropland. The former head of the EPA under the Obama administration has been attributed with saying, your emissions can be addressed by looking at where you live, how you live, and what you eat. And if you'd like to lower your carbon footprint, here is the first solution, start by calculating your carbon footprint. This link takes you to the EPA's carbon footprint calculator. You'll discover how many tons of CO2 you create per year and find some suggestions for how to lower your emissions. The next greenhouse gas, methane. Landfills are a major source of methane, which is created through anaerobic, that's without oxygen, decomposition of waste the breaking down of waste. A form of aerobic decomposition that's with oxygen that breaks down waste without creating those same amounts of methane is composting. This is important because methane is 30 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2. That means that it has a global warming potential that's 30 times stronger than what CO2 has. Which brings me to our next engaging solution. You can divert food waste from landfills by composting. You can do this on your own, or you can join a, a global initiative called Make Soil, which is a nonprofit online platform that matches soil makers, people who compost, with nearby soil supporters, people who support, who contribute scraps. And this gets local people working together with nature to reverse climate change while also making the rich soil we need to grow healthy local food for everyone. The United Nations has estimated that the rate at which we're losing topsoil currently with conventional farming methods, we will lose global topsoil in 60 years and there could be global food system collapse. And so the way to combat this is by composting and also switching over the way that we farm to regenerative agriculture rather than conventional methods. And I'll talk about that a little bit more after. But first of all, the third greenhouse gas that is important is nitrous oxide. 
industrial agriculture is one of the largest producers of human caused nitrous oxide emissions. A large part of this is due to tilling the soil. So I'll just explain it. Um, the soil is actually um, store sequesters, uh, grabs from the atmosphere more greenhouse gases than the trees, about three times more for carbon dioxide. And the soil is really a live and dynamic environment where plant roots and bacteria and mycelium, mycorrhiza from fungus and all sorts of organisms symbiotically live and there's a symbiotic relationship between certain plants and certain bacteria that pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it into the soil. And so when you have healthy soil, you have cell, soil that is being a greenhouse gas emissions sink rather than an emitter. So practices that tend to disrupt this process include tilling, the soil, destroying root networks in the ground, exposing the soil to the air and sun, and killing the microbiome in the soil that helps fix nitrogen with nitrogen fixing plants. This is important because nitrous oxide is 200 to 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Now for that solution. The Nature Conservancy is working on this as one example, there are many examples globally, and I could give an entire one hour talk and do it six times and talk about different things each time just on this transition. But just briefly, I'll give two examples. General Mills uh, is a company that uh, uh, produces many different products, including cereals. And they are currently funding the transition in the United States of a million acres of conventional farming to regenerative agriculture by 2030. The Nature Conservancy is going one step further, and they have a goal of converting 50% of all farms to regenerative agriculture practices in the United States by 2025. Regenerative agriculture is a no-till method that changes agriculture from being a greenhouse gas emitter to a greenhouse gas sink. The other um, happy um, impacts that we get from this practice is that because the um, nitrogen is being now uh, sequestered into the soil instead of being lost, the plants don't need as much fertilizer and you can actually get it to a level where you need no fertilizer and also the biodiversity that comes back into the area and into the soil allows a better equilibrium so that you also don't need pesticides. So it's um, a wonderful practice and it is gaining momentum all over the world. And I'm just giving you some examples of the United States, but I think there's some people on this call who actually are very aware of other places globally that are adopting these methods. So here's a link to the Nature Conservancy, you saw that. Now we're going to talk about the fourth greenhouse gas category hydrofluorocarbons. These were repla uh, replaced the ozone depleting chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, that were globally phased out and banned through the 1992 Montreal Protocol because they were creating those holes in the ozone layer. This is an example of the world coming together and aligning on a strategy that actually worked because we have largely healed most of those holes in the ozone layer because of the banning of CFCs. However, the main replacement, the HFCs, the hydrofluorocarbons, are also greenhouse gases. They're not depleting the ozone layer, but they are contributing to climate change. And so Project Drawdown lists replacing uh, hydrofluorocarbons with alternatives as one of the top uh, solutions to drawing down greenhouse gas emissions. And this is because hydrofluorocarbons are more than 10,000 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And if you want to learn more about those suggested solutions with Project Drawdown, you can follow this link and check out all the solutions on Project Drawdown's website. I'm going to provide that again at the end of this presentation. 
the fifth and sixth greenhouse gas categories, perfluorocarbons and sulfur hexafluoride. These are industrial process created compounds through activities like aluminum smelting, which is one of the largest producers of human caused perfluorocarbons and sulfur hexafluoride emissions. These equate to a very small percentage of the overall greenhouse gas emissions of other categories that we've gone over today. However, they are very potent. Perfluorocarbons are 6,500 to 9,200 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And sulfur hexafluoride is 24,000 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But the biggest source by far is our reliance on fossil fuels. And since World War II, that's been going up dramatically. As a result, the temperatures are going up very fast. Nineteen of the 20 hottest years have been since 2001. And the five hottest years have been the last five years. We're seeing the heat go up all over the world. Miami just had its hottest week ever measured. Here's Australia in their summer several months ago. This is a map of Australia indicating the levels of severity during a widespread heat wave from January 30 to February 1, 2020. Look at Canberra, their capital. They just set an all-time high temperature record. According to the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it is likely that heat waves are becoming more and more frequent in large parts of Europe, Asia, and Australia, and that human activity has made them twice as probable. And the IPCC scientists say with a very high likelihood with, between a confidence level of 90 to 100 percent confidence level that heat waves will occur more often and last longer over the 20th century. Ghana is one of the countries in Africa setting its all-time temperature record. Europe had the hottest year ever last year, and all of these countries have set all-time records. In Siberia, above the Arctic Circle, it went above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 38 degrees Celsius, the hottest temperature ever measured north of the Arctic Circle. The biggest changes that I saw when I was living in the Canadian Arctic Circle were that the Northwest Passage, which had always remained frozen in the summers was no longer freezing in the summers. And certain species of fish and lobster were coming further north than they'd ever been seen before. These may seem harmless, uh, or, um, but they're actually indicators, they're warning signs of something much bigger. In the world as a whole, it's useful to remember that 93% of all this heat goes into the oceans and this disrupts the water cycle. We are seeing ocean temperatures also hit a new record last year. And almost certainly again this year, this makes the ocean-based storms stronger. It also magnifies the amount of water vapor coming off the oceans into the sky. When all of that water vapor comes over the land, the precipitation events increase. And when it rushes back to the sea, the floods and mudslides increase. We just saw this devastating storm last May in the Philippines, more than half a million people affected by it. In the area between India and Bangladesh, and actually both countries were hit by this super cyclone, Ampan. And the people in the river delta there were devastated. There's a lot of out migration from those low lying areas. And when they're rescued during the pandemic, it's an extra challenge. We're also seeing the same pattern all over the world. As Pope Francis reminded the world powerfully, the poor are the ones most affected and communities of color are most affected. Here in the United States, the Poor People's Campaign is campaigning against ecological devastation along with racism and poverty and the other ills they've identified. You can see all over the world, these massive precipitation events are increasing. 
and we're seeing rainfall that breaks all records. This is a photo of a supercell with a column of rain at its center near Glasgow, Montana, in what's now being called a rain bomb. This was in Al Gore's home state a few months ago. My coworker and his family lost power during this storm. And you can see the folks in this particular region pictured would have been lucky if losing power were their worst experience. This was New Jersey. By the way, neighborhoods and communities of people of color are far more affected. This was an image last year in New Orleans. If you look at the top 10 counties most affected by flooding in the United States, 81% of the population are people of color on average. That's a pattern holding around the world. Farmers were hurt last year in the prime farmland of the Midwest. 20 million acres couldn't be farmed because of the massive downpours. There was $20 billion in damages. Globally, these rain bombs are happening four times more frequently than they were just 40 years ago. Here was one just three months ago in India and Nepal. Four million people were displaced by the flooding and the mudslides. Similar event in Guangdong province, 700,000 people affected. This one in Kenya, two and a half months ago, 100,000 families displaced. The same extra heat that causes these rain bombs and floods also causes the droughts by sucking the moisture out of the topsoil. So the droughts take place more quickly. The groundwater is used up faster. This is Europe four months ago, showing the dangerously low levels of groundwater during the summer. And the drought this year in Europe, Czech Republic has the worst drought in 500 years. Parts of Poland, the worst in 100 years. One of my climate leadership friends in the Gigaton Challenge, which I'm also going to offer next as a solution. Uh, she is a, in Bohemia in the Czech Republic in, and she let me know actually yesterday that Prague is getting hit with a COVID-19 spike and COVID-19 is amplifying already existing challenges like drought and water shortages and food shortages due to drought. By the way, now I'm gonna talk about the Giga Gigaton Challenge. This is a really exciting solution. What it is, and you can get involved too, this is a two week leadership clinic to learn how to actually lower a ton of carbon dioxide emissions. And it is entirely within the realm of possibility that you might, um, with your team, be able to have that impact in, in the real world in this leadership clinic. It's like, runs like a lab. So you'll use Agile as a project management process. And you needn't have any previous experience with, with this, just an open mind, an open heart, curiosity, and passion for teamwork. Over two weeks, you'll learn how to tackle complex challenges within the lens of climate change, and you'll be given the task of reducing one ton of carbon dioxide, while crucially also delivering benefits for the poorest and most directly impacted by climate change. I highly recommend the program, which operates on a gift economic model. It can be free if you have financial barriers. I'm coaching a cohort right now, and it's amazing. You'll learn by doing what it takes to deliver equitable, effective solutions to our greatest challenges and to rebuild the economy and reduce emissions and reimagine our world. And we need to rebuild the economy, reduce emissions, and reimagine our world. Places like Chennai and India, the sixth largest city, last year almost completely ran out of water. We need to act and learn to do things differently so Chennai doesn't become the new normal. When we have high temperatures and drought, we also see more fires. And the fires have been devastating. This is one less than four months ago in Arizona. In California last fall, we had devastating fires. And one of the causes related to climate change are pine beetle infestation, which kill the trees Pine beetle have a natural life cycle where their larvae are killed or the population is reduced in really cold winters and we're not having those cold winters anymore. And my same friend who is based in Prague actually works in this field 
and she is cleaning up pine beetle infestation trees. And they have seen a large increase in fires as a result of pine beetle kill because it disrupts the entire ecosystem of the forest. And uh, studies are starting to point to this correlation in California as well. This year, California recorded its first gigafire in modern history on October 5, after expansive August, um, uh, uh, expand the, the August complex in the northern part of the state scorched more than a million acres. The August complex is now the largest fire in California's history, according to Cal Fire, and blazes across the state have burned four million acres so far more than double the previous record set in 2018, according to Cal Fire. This fire season has also produced five of the six largest wildfires in California's history. The same thing was true in Australia at the turn of the year. The smoke circled the globe. And of course, in the Amazon, these human set fires in the Amazon are devastating as well. By the way, according to the World Wildlife Fund, 96% of forest fires are human caused. Much of this for deforestation to make way for agricultural lands. And that might sound surprising when you see all the coverage of wildfires in the news, but human beings have felled and burned nearly half of the world's forests, reducing what was once estimated to be, uh, to be six trillion trees to three trillion. So there are so many solutions I can offer related to this one. I, I would love to connect you with the Crowther, law, Crowther Labs who use satellite data to understand how many trees we have left and how many more we can plant. And there's also the Trillion Tree Platform of the World Economic Forum that is funding this work. But I wanted to focus on something that you yourself can do today. And that is the Trillion Tree Campaign which is different than the Trillion Tree platform. Trillion Tree Campaign is a nonprofit, youth-led initiative seeking to solve this issue through community building, culture change, and capacity building. You can go to this website and download an app that you use to track trees that you plant. It was created by young people in elementary school, and they built a global community who has since collectively planted 13 and a half billion trees. And you can plant trees too. And when you do, please plant native species because they evolved for your climate and soil conditions. Planting trees and changing how we manage land use is now more important than ever. With wildfires increasing in size, intensity and duration, burning hotter and longer, and fire seasons also lasting longer, tree planting is becoming more important to reforest after wildfires. In Southern Greece, pictured here, the Prime Minister of Greece pointed to climate change. The reinsurance companies are pointing to all these climate related disasters and tell us that this is completely unsustainable. The heat is also melting the ice in Greenland, the glacier turned into water, NASA's estimate of the ice loss in Greenland shows that it's four times faster than they had originally thought. The same thing is true in Antarctica, where the ice melting has accelerated quite dramatically. And when this massive amount of ice in those two regions melts, sea levels go up. The top 10 cities by population affected by sea level, you see a lot of them in South Asia. The top 10 by asset risk, Number one is Miami. And sea level rise is the reason why this octopus showed up in a parking lot in Miami. New York and Newark, $130 billion of real estate assets at risk. But the people most at risk are in these low-lying Pacific Island nations. And in some places, they're already having to move. It's also a national security issue. It creates problems for food and water and health. And refugees, as we saw after the Syrian drought, this has destabilized the political equilibrium in parts of Europe. And estimates of climate refugee situations in the Southern United States predict millions of Americans displaced by the end of this century. And being a Canadian, to me that means a lot of people are gonna be moving to Canada. 
It's also a health crisis, a medical emergency caused by the climate crisis all over the world. Many consequences. Tropical diseases are moving toward the poles and air travel is one of the reasons why, but the conditions are changing due to the climate crisis where these diseases can take root and become endemic. And as we see more destruction of previously wild lands, we're seeing more diseases appear because there are millions of viruses in the areas where people have not lived very much in the past. We get five new diseases every year including the COVID-19 pandemic now. Viruses that jump to new species, such as humans, are called zoonotic diseases. When previously undisturbed habitats, which have sort of like, it's, it's like there's a closed loop ecosystem of viruses that are only affecting certain species. When those habitats get destroyed, the risk of so-called spillover events, where viruses jump to new species, increases. Two of the highest risks for these spillover events are habitat destruction and factory farming. Ravinder Segal, researcher at San Francisco State University, studies spillover events and has found a direct relationship between deforestation and zoonotic diseases jumping to new species like us. While it's difficult to influence where people choose to live, you can influence how people manage the wild lands that they are currently transforming into farmland to feed the growing population. There are five key ways that you can contribute to cutting down the risk of future pandemic and zoonotic disease spillover events and slow and reverse climate change. And these are by choosing how you eat. The top one that World Wildlife Fund plant, uh, plate, uh, Planet Connection talks about on their site here is to eliminate palm oil from your diet, since this is one of the leading causes of deforestation for agricultural lands. And probably tied for the top one, I would call, I personally would call this the top one, is to choose a plant-forward diet. And that's my nice way of saying a vegan diet. Since animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of deforestation worldwide, and these are huge risk factors for spillover events, it can also cut your carbon footprint down dramatically. My carbon footprint was cut in half when I became vegan after eight years of eating a so-called paleo diet. The third strategy is to avoid soy. More than 80% of soy is fed to animals such as pigs, chickens, cows, and animal agriculture has caused 75% of deforestation to date. The fourth solution is to eat more variety. 75% of the world's food supply comes from just 12 plants and five animal species. And finally, check out the World Wildlife Fund Plate Planet Connection to learn more. Speaking of zoonotic disease spillover events in the current pandemic, air pollution increases the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Air pollution already kills 9 million people a year and the same burning of fossil fuels that creates the global warming pollution also creates the particulates that cause more lung diseases and heart diseases. And in California and also in the, in the previous times in Australia, we know that the wildfires are part of that air pollution now and there's a feedback loop between climate change and causes of wildfire and then increasing of climate change. And so we need to break this cycle it also makes people more vulnerable to COVID-19 pandemic all over the world. More air pollution, a higher death rate from COVID-19. And again, we see this pattern show up worse among minority populations and poor populations. Black Americans are dying at a rate more than twice as high as white Americans from COVID-19. Many reasons, but the climate crisis is one of the principal ones. Not just people are affected, and this is the part that I sometimes find it hard not to cry when I think about this. We're in danger of losing half of all the living species on this earth in this century. <clears throat> in fact, it is estimated that we lose up to 200 species a day. Humans and our livestock account for 96% of the mammals and 70% of the birds on land. <clears throat> 
and that's mostly chickens for the birds. David Attenborough gives eye-opening observations and four suggestions for how you can help rewild the planet. First, he says, <clears throat> all of us together, we can phase out fossil fuels and replace with renewables. Second, we can upgrade to efficient food production and adopt a predominantly plant-based diet. Third, we can properly manage our oceans with a global network of no fish zones and international waters treaties. And fourth, we can conserve the nature we still have. And when David Attenborough talks about upgrade to efficient food production and adopt a predominantly plant-based diet, he's partly talking about going vegan and he's also partly talking about regenerative agriculture. To learn about regenerative agriculture in the United States, watch Kiss the Ground if you haven't already. It's very accessible and really inspiring. The cost of not making these changes is too great. And we haven't even talked about ocean acidification or infrastructure or some of these others. I will add one more. It's the number one threat to the global economy. Fourth year in a row, it's been designated as such. So do we have to change? Yes, we absolutely do. What about the second question? Can we change? Well, luckily, the answer to that question is yes, too, because we have the solutions at hand. Just look at this. 20 years ago, the best projections for wind energy were that by the year 2010, we could reach 30 gigawatts of wind energy. Well, we beat that mark in 2010 and we've kept going. Recently, we beat it by 22 times over. With demand for electricity growing and the climate crisis deepening, the world needs a viable cost competitive replacement for dirty fossil fuels. Wind energy can be an excellent alternative, powering our lives without destroying our planet. Wind energy has the potential to supply the world's electricity needs 40 times over. Wind and solar are the cheapest sources of electricity generation for people across more than two thirds of the world as of 2019. With solar, it's even more dramatic. The best estimates 18 years ago were that the amount of solar energy we could install each year might reach one gigawatt per year by 2010. Well, we beat that mark when 2010 arrived by 17 times over. And last year, we beat that mark by 121 times over. This exponential curve is even steeper than the one for wind and rising even faster. Because the cost of renewable energy continues to come down dramatically. Just look at one example in Chile. Look at all of the solar farms that they have built and are approved for construction to begin. This is a breakout scenario that we're seeing in quite a few regions around the world. And it is a cause for tremendous hope. We're seeing a very rapid transition. And we're not going to run out of it because we get as much energy from the sun in one hour that would supply all of the electricity the world needs for a full year. It can be enhanced further with storage capacity. The projections forward show that this is a new trillion dollar industry, which is going to make solar and wind even more useful. In transportation, we're seeing the beginnings of a massive shift to electric vehicles. And I know some people on this call who already have been driving electric vehicles for years. And this can cut the global warming pollution there. There is another positive sign. So can we change? We can. The final question, the most important one, will we change? Well, that's partly up to us, but we've got the Paris Agreement. And don't be fooled by the fact that the current president of the United States wants to withdraw. The US can't legally withdraw until the day after this coming November's election. Were there to be a new president, that new president could give 30 days notice and the US is right back in the agreement. The market is also changing to help us in this journey. 
here is the stock market going up, but here is the energy sector, the fossil fuel sector. They're bad investments now. And that word is getting out and we're seeing a huge shift of assets toward the sustainability revolution. In the US, we're already seeing almost half of our states with more than half of our people moving faster than the Paris Agreement requires. We're seeing cities move as well. And we're seeing businesses move. More than 240 global companies have pledged to go 100% renewable. And more companies are adding their names and pledges to this list every single day. And the rising young generation, the Greta generation, they're leading the way. They are demanding a better world as they have a right to do. So join those who are using their voices, using their votes and using their choices to fight for their future, their community and their world. Use your voice, use your vote, use your choices in the marketplace and elsewhere like your world depends on it. Speak truth to power because actually your world does depend on it. Thank you. Now, before I take questions, I'm going to do a quick review. <laughs> I see Rachel applauding, thank you. I'm going to do a quick review of the resources that we covered, especially since I wasn't screen sharing at the beginning. So here is the first one. This is a link to 24hoursofreality.org. And there are a number of solutions that are suggested here. One is to secure your voting plan. If you're in America, pledge to vote and ask three friends to do the same and continue the conversation in your community. And I'm going to switch to another slide because I have someone on the call who is from Australia. And it is important to also highlight solutions in Australia, contact your elected representatives to support and communicate and implement the Paris Agreement before the UNFCCC, that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, next meeting. And the targets must be to set clear and ambitious plans for action by 2030 to ensure the targets are in line with a world in which warming does not exceed 1.5 degrees and to lay out clear national plans to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Thank you, Australia. The next solution that we covered in the main 10 is check what your carbon footprint is. If you measure it, you can control it. You can make it better, you can improve it. And the EPA website that has the carbon footprint calculator here also gives suggestions for how to lower your carbon footprint. Compost whether it's on your own or with community organizations such as Make Soil. If you're in the United States, check out what the Nature Conservancy is doing. Get involved in the regenerative movement. And for anyone, check out the Project Drawdown website. Check out the solutions that are listed by priority of impact. And if you feel called, check out the Gigaton Challenge. It's really an amaz amazing project and it's uh, very playful as well. It's serious and playful at the same time. So I can't recommend this one enough. Check out the Trillion Tree Campaign. Go to their website, download the app and start planting trees. Native species, please. Check out World Wildlife Fund's Plate Planet Connection. And if you want vegan re recipes, <laughs> Uh, let me know because I love eating plant forward diet. Check out David Attenborough's How to Save Your Planet suggestions. Very inspiring. And finally, if you have the inclination and desire, please watch Kiss the Ground. It is very inspiring and uplifting. So I will post all of the links to those solutions in the chat box now. And I'm going to stop sharing so that we can all see each other. And I am open to questions. Thank 
you so much. You're welcome. It's really, really awesome. And I'm really grateful to be included and, and see all these awesome solutions and just learn more. Um, I think the biggest question, and this isn't like a, it's not like a yes or no question. <laughs> but um, I think like from my perspective, there's at least in the country right now, there's so little government support for really focusing on solutions. And so I think, um, yeah, the biggest question I have is like, can we do it without government support? And obviously, like you said at the beginning, like hope comes from action. And so the more involved that I'm, that I get, the more that I can spread that and, and get other people involved. So I see how it's in some ways a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I think that's like just in my mind. Yep, I, I definitely, I have a particular perspective on that because I work at Apple and Apple is uh, expanding the renewables market in order to meet their own goal of carbon neutrality. So the company is already, um, carbon neutral in all the data centers and all the headquarters. And now what the company is focusing on is by 2030, we're gonna be entirely carbon neutral and that's all our supply chain, the life cycle of all the products. And in order to do that, it means that we need to deeply collaborate with all of the partners that are involved with that supply chain. So it's gonna change the entire market. And an example of this right now is um, in China, uh, Apple coordinated with 11 other major companies to fund the creation of a wind farm. And so that Apple could be uh, running on renewable energy and the 11 other companies that wanted also to run on renewable energy could do so as well. But because of the success of that wind farm, now 70 companies have joined on and mm -hmm. a second wind farm is being built, funded by all those companies. So that's an example of bypassing government, sometimes the corporate world can have a giant impact. And if you look at it in terms of um, greenhouse gas, and gas emissions accounting, uh, a business, for example, say a clothing chain that just has three locations in, in one location in Arizona, one in California, maybe one in Oregon, that, that um, just having the stores open is going to create the emissions equivalent to about 400 homes for an entire year. And so tackling the corporate emissions is a huge lever. And this is one example where uh, corporate autonomy from government is beneficial. And so, of course, that's within a legal framework. When I say corporate autonomy from government, the, Corporations are also fun functioning within certain regulations. Um, but at any rate, there, there are lots of areas, municipal groups also. The Gigaton Challenge, for example, largely focuses on municipalities. And a, if you look at the, mayor, the mayoral agreements, uh, both in Canada and the United States, and there are similar frameworks happening globally, where municipalities are pledging carbon neutrality. Some of them are already carbon neutral. And that's irrespective of which state or province or prefecture they're in. Even if the top down initiatives are not there, there's tons of grassroots, real impact work that can be done. And so much of it is about collaboration. <laughs> And I see someone else also joining now, perhaps um, an hour difference on the time zone. And so Nancy, who just joined, we can send you the link to the recording. Any other questions? I don't really have any questions. This is a great presentation. Just seeing everything that you captured sort of together in one place is pretty awesome. And. Uh, are you going to show this to your cohort? You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I could see how it actually is something that would be great to keep to have the recording available for any of the gigaton teams to um, just to be able to used as a reference because I'm sure people are going to come in some I'm sure people come in with ideas and things they already want to do but there'll be others that have the question of well I don't know what to pick or how do I find out you know what makes any sense so this is great no th I'm glad I was able to jump on I'm gonna have to get off in a second here because uh my co-coach and I are gonna chat today so oh good great yeah um, if yeah. you could say one se sentence for Rachel because I invited her to join the challenge um, about your experience with it, what would you say is the best thing about it? I think the best thing, honestly, is being around a group of people who want to do something, who really want to do something from all over the world, from all different walks of life, that suddenly make it feel possible and create the safe place to be able to work on this and deal with whatever comes up. Um, I think, you know, I did the summer school that this organization put on and it brings up a lot of personal challenges when you do work like this. And I think that they offer a really great space to do this work and to feel like you might be able to make a difference as mm -hmm. a single person. So I'm really hopeful for this whole Gigaton Challenge experiment over the next three months because I could see that if it can get traction sort of combined with some of the stuff, Allie, that you just outlined is already happening. I sort of feel like it's, it's a chance to start bringing everything together and sort of close out that big picture. And if it starts to do that, and it really does what Zaid is hoping, you know, I just feel like there's this tremendous potential over the course of the next year to shift the momentum in the right direction. So like, I have this sort of like complete schizophrenic like fear and panic and despair so, like oh my god but if it doesn't work to end this like just incredible <laughs> like optimism and joy and anticipation so it's like I'm sort of like okay read it in <laughs> so, so yeah so I mean I, I think it could be tremendous and I think I'm seeing you know the October teams I think you know they were challenged to sort of get everybody together get it up and running have enough people sign up I think there's a lot of wait and see attitudes too I, I hear of a lot more people well November I can do the November one so I'm sort of thinking that the October session is also pretty important to get some traction because I think then it'll start to build so yeah next week we get going <laughs> pretty excited <and> nervous so. <laughs> but thanks for doing this I appreciate it you're welcome I'm really glad that you joined and uh, and I see Nancy just joined um, you caught the tail end in the question and answer period uh, and so what I can do is send you uh, the recording yes please I don't know why like somehow messed up with the time zone like, I, I couldn't it was imagine crazy. why, since we live in different parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've been running around like a British Indian, like, yeah, still got a bit of work to do. <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, we're working in a cross-functional global team with, I don't know how many different time zones, so. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's totally okay. Here. Will you will you post it um, either on Basecamp or um, yeah, on Signal? I'll do. Yeah. yeah, super interesting. Well, <laughs> you're welcome, and thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. See you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Ali.